Hello and welcome to tonight's event from the British Library. I'm Brett Walsh of the Cultural Events Department and I'm super excited to welcome you to this uh, event on the poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Uh, before we kick off, I have a few points of housekeeping. We will be taking questions later in the event, so if you want to submit a question, please use the form below the video. And you can buy Fiona Sampson's new book using the bookshop button at the top of the screen there. Um, so tonight's conversation is going to be chaired by Peter Salmon. Peter is an Australian writer living in the UK and he recently published a biography of Derrida called An Event Perhaps and it was released to critical acclaim in 2020. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Peter. Welcome to the British Library tonight, whichever wing of the British Library you're in, there are many, many wings throughout this country and um, it's fantastic to have you here. We're here to discuss Two-Way Mirror, the new biography of Elizabeth Barrett Browning by Fiona Sampson. So welcome to everyone. Um, I will be harassing you about buying the book. I'm assuming that most of you have actually already bought the book. So, um, so ignore that if you have. Um, I'll also be harassing you about asking some questions for Fiona during the night. But I'd first of all like to welcome Fiona Sampson, who will now say hi to me. Hello, Peter. And I'm going to do the bio of Fiona, but we also have Mark Padmore, who will be doing some of the readings tonight. But Fiona Sampson is a leading poet and writer, published in 38 languages. Her 27 books include eight poetry collections, an edition of Percy Bysshe Shelley, and a critically acclaimed In Search of Mary Shelley. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and published her acclaimed biography of Elizabeth Barrett Browning in 2021. Doing some of the readings of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's poetry tonight will be Mark Padmore, who has an international career in opera, concert and recital. His work with directors Peter Brook, Katie Mitchell, Mark Morris and Deborah Warner and has performed with the world's leading orchestra. He was the artist in residence of the 2017-18 season with Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra and in 2016 was voted vocalist of the year by Musical America. So welcome to everyone who's here and Fiona, congratulations on your book. Thank you very much, Peter. And I think it falls to me to introduce you. So Peter Salmon is a fellow biographer, which is why it's a thrill to have him introducing me. In fact, we're speaking from the biographer's house and Peter's biography of Jacques Derrida, an event perhaps, uh, was published by Verso in November and has been very enthusiastically uh, received. I was going to say ecstatically, but I realize that's probably an inappropriate thing to say about the world of philosophy. And Peter's also a novelist, but he's not a poet, I'm glad to say. Yes, I've, I've dodged that bullet. So um, welcome to any poets who are out there. <laughs> um, so we're gonna be talking about Elizabeth Barrett Browning tonight, particularly um, Fiona's biography of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Um, and Fiona, can I ask you why now? for writing a biography of Elizabeth Barrett Browning? Well, Elizabeth Barrett Browning was a canonical figure for me um, when I was, well, coming into poetry and actually even earlier than that. And she, um, she's one of those rare figures who is actually a woman who's um, in the old anthologies. Um, and yet there hasn't been a biography of her since um, the 1980s when Margaret Forster wrote her a great biography, um, which is called Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Um, but at that point, quite a lot of the um, archival material, um, the letters and journals from really from Elizabeth Barrett Browning's prime and the, the time when she was doing most of her work were not yet available. So it's a kind of biography which is absolutely wonderful about the earlier years. And there has been nothing that has told Elizabeth's own story since since then. Um, and that seems to me a huge loss because she is still Britain's leading woman poet. She is the first female lyric poet. She is uh, an important modernizer of um, poetry. She marks the turn from romanticism to Victorianism, which you might think is a mixed blessing, but that's what she did. Um, she is a paradigm of the lockdown life, which is something I'm sure we'll explore. Absolutely. And uh, she influenced a huge number of other writers. I mean, from Emily Dickinson to Swinburne, Oscar Wilde, Virginia Woolf, Roger Kipling. She had very varied admirers. And so I think it behoves us to see and to remember what all the fuss was about. Absolutely. And I think it behoves us to listen to a short reading to start the night um, from Aurora Lee, her novel, which her, her a poetic novel, which was the um, examination of a woman becoming a poet, wasn't it? And probably the first time that it happened. 
Yes. So let's go set reading. Aurora Lee, book one, lines one to eight. Of writing many books, there is no end. And I, who have written much in prose and verse for others' uses, will write now for mine. Will write my story for my better self. As when you paint your portrait for a friend who keeps it in a drawer and looks at it long after he has ceased to love you, just to hold together what he was and is. The beautiful voice of Mark Padmore reading the beautiful poetry of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Um, I'm going to ask the most basic of questions at this point. Who was she? Well, yes. Well, she was many things, actually. I mean, I think one of the things that I think one of the reasons for writing um, biographies of women of the past, but also possibly contemporary women writers, one could argue, is that they, we are many things and somewhat in the eye of the beholder. But of course, there are facts about Elizabeth's life. So she was born in 1806. So that makes her halfway between Mary Shelley and Charlotte Bronte. So she's nine years after Mary Shelley and 10 years before Charlotte Bronte. She had a really precocious childhood, um, in a way self-educated. Um, she was writing poems from the age of six. Uh, she was writing in plays in French at the age of eight. She became a classicist and her first book was published to celebrate her 14th birthday. In other words, she wrote it when she was 13, The Battle mm -hmm. of Marathon. As you do. She, as you do. Um, she contracted uh, a likely virus and post-viral syndrome when she was 15, which was the start of a life of chronic ill health and disability against which she, um, her writing was in a sense a form of resistance. I, I always think of it as a kind of reaching past the confines of her room to, to her wider audience. Um, she came to real critical attention in 1838 and then in 1844. So 1838 is her first sort of Book of Her Maturity, Sarah from Another Poems, and uh, 1844 is Poems, 1844. Uh, lots of critical attention, and um, she's nominated to become the next Poet Laureate when Wordsworth dies. Of course, she doesn't. Um, she, um, But she's the first woman to be so nominated. She then marries Robert Browning, who to whose attention she has come first as a poet. She goes off to Italy with him. She becomes quite radicalized. She writes very formative political poetry, which helps change British popular opinion about a number of issues, particularly Italian re reunification, but also abolition of slavery, the rights of women. And when she dies in Florence in 1861, she is given a sort of civic heroine's funeral as um, a heroine of Italian reunification. Mm. So it's a kind of a public life as well as the private life for which she is traditionally known. Uh, all, all of this is uh, astonishing for any writer, of course, um, but I'm particularly interested in the fact that she was a woman doing all this at the time. You know, she, you're talking about politics, you're talking about the personal, you're talking about you know, married to Robert Browning, but also, you know, I, I think in many, for many of us, we hear of Elizabeth Barrett Browning through um, How Do I Love Thee, Let Me Count the Ways, but she has a very, very powerful impact, obviously. Yes, she did. She had, um, she had a great impact on particularly women writers of her epoch and beyond. I mean, she was the great permission giver for someone like Emily Dickinson, and not just someone like Emily Dickinson, but actually Emily Dickinson, who, um, had the great Rossetti engraving, which I think is the finest image of Elizabeth Barrett Browning, um, hanging in her bedroom, you know, her room in which she wrote and lived. Um, but she's also a modernizer. She's, I think that Elizabeth Barrett Browning, we forget that Elizabeth Barrett Browning was in a sense um, in tandem with Dickens. It's, it's the same gesture of um, moving towards the social utility and the moral purpose of literature. So like Dickens, she's writing for the new mass audience of the 19th century, the newly literate, um, newly middle class, lower middle class, the kind of Clark's class as it were, the, the families who are used to reading by the far side, 
Um, so like Dickens, she's publishing in the periodicals as well as her books, she's publishing in periodicals, which are those eagerly waited periodicals that we remember, you know, people waiting for the next instalment of, mm -hmm. you know, Little Nell or whatever. And like Dickens, she's writing about the purposes of um, society and she's writing a newly narrative, accessible, not so elevated way. There's a kind of intimacy and quotidian character to her language and a slight sentimentality to her emotional register and less abstraction, but more kind of moral principled writing. And that is really, she's really part of the, the shift into the Victorian zeitgeist, kind of the shift towards family values and, um, and a sense of the risks of modernity that, you know, romanticism had embraced, you know, science is fantastic, new, you know, what can we think of Frankenstein? You know, the, the Victorian experience is on the one hand, let's make lots of money, but on the other hand, you know, a kind of mm -hmm. um, dark satanic mills. I mean, okay, Blake, yeah. that's Blake and he's earlier, but you know, there's a, there's a yeah. beginning to be good works of social conscience and, and, um, and she's mm. part of that dual approach that, that develops through the mid 19th century. Is she aware she's doing that? Yes, she's aware. She's quite explicit about, from quite young, about the moral purposes of poetry. She, that um, she sees poetry's purpose as to illustrate what would otherwise remain abstract in, um, in the imagination. So she sees it as a kind of the handmaid of thought, actually. She sees it as the handmaid of philosophy. Right, yes. It's certainly impressive reading the biography. She, she studied a lot of the philosophers, the Greeks and so forth. And she does seem to have, have, have take, or taken that on board is a, is a stupid phrase for it. But she does seem to have incorporated that into what she was trying to do. She was a, she was a very intellectual writer, wasn't she, in many, many ways? Yes, she was a craftswoman as well. I mean, I think she, she you know, my last biography was of Mary Shelley. And what's interesting about Mary Shelley is that, um, you know, she's there sort of fully, you know, she writes her masterpiece when she's still a teenager. Whereas Elizabeth Barbrown is the opposite. It's a very conscious and dogged form of self-construction. Um, so that she is, um, she's quite aware that she, on the one hand, she has this elevated notion of the classics. They are these, um, the great works and she admires them, but she also thinks that that's how you learn prosody. That's how you train yourself to be a, to be a poet. That's your 10,000 hours, as it were, that you, you, you have to put yes. in the, the hard yards. And actually it does make a difference because you can see her emerging. It's quite a conscious, willed self-development. I don't mean in a careerist way. She's not quite so good at that, although she's not bad at it, but in the technical terms, she has a strong sense, strong pragmatic sense about how you become a writer. Yeah, and, and in terms of prag pragmatism, uh, returning to the fact that she's a woman, which I think we will return to a few times. I mean, that's difficult, isn't it? That, at that particular time to enter the literary scene, to become part of the literary scene. I mean, how does she actually do that? Yes, it is very difficult. Um, I mean, she's interesting in that unlike um, almost all her female peers, she uh, she always had her name on the title page. So most of her, most of her peers, that's to say the women we've, we remember, um, wrote either pseudonymously under a male pseudonym, George Eliot, the Bronte sisters or the Bell brothers, or they wrote anonymously. So Jane Austen was a lady and um, Mary Shelley was the author of Frankenstein, uh, which is a little bit of a circular bit of nomenclature. <laughs> um, so um, despite that, she gradually acquired serious critical attention. Um, and I think that starts again, that does start in 1838 with the Seraphim, where she starts to have, she has a serious publisher. And serious books from serious publishers simply are reviewed. And yes. so although there is always a strain of reviewing, which is something she satirizes at great length in Aurora Lee, um, when she's looking at a woman's emerging life, um, 
although she in which it's you know she's kind of a performing monkey because she's a woman who's a poet or there's a sense later when she's a political poet that you know she shouldn't be troubling her head with these things she must have not understood them got them wrong nevertheless there she is um in in full view and and it's, it's when she's nominated for the laureateship it's by the Athenaeum which is a very conservative establishment publication you know she is and her reviews are in the mainstream press, partly because at this stage there aren't little poetry magazines in the same way as there will be in the 20th century. That's that's a, a phenomenon of modernism. It's not a phenomenon of romanticism and and of um, Victorianism. So she, she she is reviewed, and her poems are singled out for review, even when she's being published in anthology, um, and those reviewers aren't aren't you know are sort of looking past at Joan in, in a way. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that that does reminds us, thinking about the anthologies, it makes us think about um, the importance of mentors in her life. She was very wise, and I think she, it was, I think this was intuitive. She had a sense that she needed um, mentors. She had a sense quite young. I mean, when her essay on poetry was published, she, when she's 21, 20 actually, um, she immediately acquires three mentors, um, Hugh Stuart Boyd, who's a local, a classicist local to her in Herefordshire, who was really problematic for her because his gifts were mediocre and he was a married man who was trying to groom her to have a relationship. So there's kind of real suppression going on containment. It's completely unheard of in, in poetry ever since that, that sort of... Relationship. Yes, and execrable. <laughs> I mean, when you read his verse, you can see why. Right. Um, <laughs> um, there are a couple of poems, particularly about um, a pleasure party going up on the Morville Hills and getting struck by lightning. And... Um, they're really quite McGonagall-ish. I mean, he's okay with metre <laughs> because of the classical stuff, but right. the content is just mortifying. Mm. Um, and Elizabeth, who at that stage is already quite an acute critic, somehow sublimates this and is able to see past it to some inner capacity in him, which of course mm. none of the rest of us can. We can't see an inner capacity. Um, mm. So there's Hugh Stuart Boyd. For some years, he hangs around and hangs around in inordinately in her psychic space. Um, then there's Sir Uvedale Price, who is a family friend, who is quite the opposite, also a classicist, but the man who, who brought the idea of the picturesque. Uh, so the last of the three romantic categories, the, the sublime, the beautiful, and then he added the picturesque into British culture, who's a very old man by the time she gets to know him and, and has, you know, has very distinguished friends and um, is friends with Wordsworth indeed. Um, and who um, kind of gives her his blessing in a way. And then there is John Kenyon, who is a distant cousin and who is a literary figure and knows everybody. And he is a, a little bit later on in her 30s. He is a wonderful mentor and, in fact, remains a mentor all through her the, most of her life until he dies. And it's he who introduces her to Wordsworth. It's he who introduces her to Miss Mitford, who is the um, the other mentor, the female figure, the female novelist, who Mary Russell Mitford, who then starts publishing Elizabeth and starts introducing Elizabeth to other women like Lady Dacre, who is Barbarina Wilmot, the ladies of Langothlin, these um, very early 19th century important women writers to whom, to, from whom she sort of takes a baton, who hand their baton on to her. So yeah. all these mentors are part of that same process. Yeah, fantastic. Well, one of the things that um, I think is always interesting about poets, poets who are women, is the way that they are often traduced and uh, one of the things about Elizabeth Barrett Browning, she wrote, How Do I Love Thee? Let Me Count the Ways, which is very convenient in some sense that we can say, oh, here's an emotional woman poet. Blah, blah. But her political poetry is incredibly vital and wonderful and powerful. And it was a huge part of what she did. And I, I know your experience as a poet is that you you write poetry often that has intellectual heft and it's, you know, ignored <laughs> or not noticed um but for elizabeth barrett browning her politics were absolutely terrific weren't they yes they were um she her political conscience evolved 
so she um she is the daughter and the granddaughter of slavers i mean one of the things that we tend to forget about elizabeth Bat browning is that she believed herself to be bame and not without reason in the sense that her family were an old jamaican family who had not only intermarried but all those kind of sexual crimes had gone on all those exploitations all those unequal relationships and she had first cousins who were bame she had um various kind of nieces who were and nephews who were bame so it was an entirely reasonable assumption on her part but at the same time like other family members who were actually so so situated themselves including for example her grandmother's close friend treppy um who who was bame but also kept slaves um you know she was part of she was a she she was a beneficiary of slavery when she was a child. So, and, sorry, how how were they beneficiaries of slavery? Can could you just unpack? well because they they owned cars they owned plantations and it was from that from trading in sugar was how the fact where the family fortune came from right, on right. both sides of her family, which also applies to Robert Browning's father's side, except that Robert Browning's father eschewed that. So, yeah. by the time she was a young adult, Elizabeth had come to realize that I mean, conveniently, the Brits had abolished slavery, although. In so deeply and perfectly, <laughs> um, and uh, but America hadn't. So right. Elizabeth became an ardent abolitionist at the time when um, you know uh, Britain and her family were no longer owning owning, if you can own a person, which of course you can't, slaves. But Americans were. But it was sincere. I mean, she was kind of she was revolted. She said. Um, she has a very nice quote about how um, she says a philanthropist. So by the time she's this is 1845, so she's not quite 40. She writes to a friend, a philanthropist and a liberal who advocates the slave trade is philanthropic veneering. In other words, you can't do slavery nicely. She understands that. And before right. she has left home, she writes the runaway slave at Pilgrim's Point, which is not which is kind of horrifying even today and this is um, amazing to see the British Library have the manuscript of it um in you can see how hard one the poem is um so it's a very very dark poem and it's a poem in which there's not only enslavement but rape resulting in a, a child um who is who's the color of whose skin condemns it in its mother's eyes and so the mother the raped woman kills the child as the result of the rape, and she is murdered as a result by her rapist, in effect. Um, so, I mean, it's a very, very dark poem. And yes. in other words, it's saying that slavery isn't some sort of economic relation, it's a sadistic relation. Yes. And it's also saying that it's also not turning a blind eye to the sexual violence that was intrinsic to slavery. And that yes. would have been extraordinarily shocking. It's shocking now to read. It would have been extraordinarily shocking in 1848 when she gave it, donated it to an abolitionist publication to sell, in other words, in aid of the big, the good cause. Yeah. But before that, in 1843, she'd written The Cry of the Children, which is about, um, you know, indentured child labour, child slavery labour in, in, um, in Britain. Um, and that, she published that in Blackwood. So that's a really mainstream place. So lots of readers. Yeah. Could, could I, mean, I, just, sorry, sorry. Go I was going to ask, can I just go back to that slide of, of the, the runaway slave poem? Because you, you're a poet yourself and you say that was a very hard one. Just looking at that manuscript, it, it really seems like she was attacking it in some sense. And it was a very difficult thing for her to produce. Is yes. that your sort of understanding of it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's obviously a huge question about register, isn't there? You know, how extreme do you make it? It's, you're making it quite extreme by the kind of story you're telling, but then how um, how melodramatic? You know, there are errors of taste which are which matter so much in something that's high stakes like this that they become errors of they become a kind of obscenity themselves. I mean, you know, it's 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 like the Adorno, you know, no 
lyric poetry after Auschwitz is what Theodore Adorno actually said, not no poetry after Auschwitz, that there are certain tones in which you cannot speak about certain kinds of thing. And there are certain tones which aren't appropriate when you're dancing on the rim of the volcano, so to speak. Mm. So, yeah, and I think also, I mean, I've got a soft spot for manuscripts where people are writing some stanzas around to the side. and You can see that it's kind of an erratum, but it's not an erratum. It's a supplementary thought. Yeah. Because it's not yeah. automatic the stanzas are in the, in the order they are. It's a narrative poem, but it's also got reflective stanzas. You, you know, you can see, you know, there's, there are questions about order there too. Yes. Now, now, standing slightly outside the frame at this point is Robert Browning, uh, also a poet, obviously, um, and who came into her life. And, and obviously, many people who have experienced Elizabeth Barrett Browning have done it through the terrible, terrible um, Rudolf Bézier um, uh, play, film, 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 where somehow Robert comes and saves Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And that's not strictly true, might one say. <laughs> one might say that yes thank you for that cue yes um i mean you know elizabeth's life got a lot better when she fell in love and after years of secret courtship married robert browning and they went to live in italy in haste and secretly so her father couldn't stop them not strictly in elopement but not far off and he got a lot better in a number of ways because she was really in love with robert and he was really in love with her they obviously had a great time together um because the climate was good for her health and the food was good for her health, because she became able to do all sorts of things. She had a literary salon life, an artistic salon life at that point, because she was able to have a child, although she had four miscarriages. But still, at the age of 43, she had a child who survived, who survived her, was her, his parents' great kind of custodian and archivist, first archivist. So all of that. Um, but it wouldn't be quite right to say that he rescued her in the sense that, in the Rudolf Bézier sense, because she was no swooning neurasthenic before that. I mean, she was, we've been talking about her craft, she was extraordinarily self-made. You know, at a time when she, when to be a woman writer and intellectual was unheard of, it's still problematic today, but it was absolutely sort of beyond the cultural pale, she doggedly did that. She could have been, she could have settled for the domestic arts or a nice life as an invalid. She didn't. She pushed herself. She worked against the grain of kind of continual threat of death. She kind of altered her beliefs. She tried to find a sense of life after death and found she couldn't find that sense. She kind of was constantly... She worked, she worked very hard um, to create herself. So in that sense, he didn't rescue her. Also, it was largely her money they ran away on. Um, and last but not least, um, mm -hmm. we have to remember that he was six years her junior and that when they ran away together, he'd had some success, a great deal of success with his first book and then had seen as having taken a wrong turn and kind of lost it. And she was the the great rising, not just hope, but the great emergent poet of her generation. Mm -hmm. And she was far ahead of him, both in terms of professional reputation, but also in terms of professional achievement and in terms of the modernity of her verse. I mean, the books, the kind of narrative writing for which Browning, after her death, would become so famous, include the books from men and women onwards, although she was alive when that was written, are taking on the lessons that she gave him, as it were, because they are yeah. developing her style of poetics further. She's not copying him, he is copying her. And it's a matter of public record. You can see by the dates of the manuscripts and by the dates of the publication of the books. Yeah. And yet, posthumously, as it were, the narrative's been the reverse, that somehow he was doing that and she kind of came along for the ride in, in ways personal and professional. Yeah. Can, can we actually, actually be absolutely frank about this? When they get together, if you want to call it that, she's the better poet and he learns from her. Mm. And I think, and one of the touching things about reading the biography is he acknowledges that. It's that that's not some dark secret in his life. He actually acknowledges that they have a very happy marriage and he knows that he's the bloke who's not quite as good as his missus. Can we do it that way? Yes, that's true. But it pulls for him. 
So after a few years, he gets, he's got really got writer's block. And then as she gets iller, as she goes into her 50s, early 50s, he begins to have much more of an independent life. And he... Oh. He's had a child at this point as, as well. Well, they've had a child. so that's... They've had a child, they've had pen, yes. And there is always that sense that he has a separate study and she doesn't. Um, so they are still observing the gender conventions, you know, even as they go through the motions of she is Elizabeth Fat Rowning. And quite soon, each the reviews of each one mention the other on passant, either to hers tend to be to sort of say, oh, well, you know, of course, there's the young Turk, you know, Robert Browning. There is a, there is a, I think, a loss that comes with adding Browning to her name. Yeah. I think it's a, I think I found the same thing working on Mary Shelley. There's a sense that whatever they contract within the couple, and certainly Shelley's contract was lousy <laughs> compared to the Browning's contract. Um, it's just so difficult to write about uh, a writer who is a woman if her surname is the same as the man's. Browning just does denote Robert and Shelley just does denote Percy Bysshe. Um, I mean, if they hadn't married those people, then um, Godwin might have denoted Mary, who we know as Shelley, Yes. And Barrett would have denoted Elizabeth because she wasn't sharing it with anybody, perhaps. But there is a kind of striking through of the identity that comes along, just like in a Mills and Boone almost, you know, yeah. take your pick, happy marriage or writing a reputation. I mean, of course, actually, Elizabeth wrote her best work while after she married and while she was with Robert. So, I mean, you yeah. know, both of them th thrived. But I don't think we should forget that there may have been difficulties. And in both cases, can we say, and I mean, it's a difficult thing to say, that the the wives, if you want to put it that way, were the better writers? Oh, I'm quite a fan of Percy. Actually, I'm quite a fan <laughs> of Robert too. But I don't think I don't think the wives were worse writers. Right. Okay. You know, and I think I think that's the other thing, you know, that terrible sense that there has to be a comparative. If you're with a man, yeah. you have to be less than him. Or it's problematic that you're more than him. You're a sacred monster. You can't just be any longer. You're always going to be in relation for the rest of your life. Yeah. Maybe talking of which, we ought to hear a sonnet from the Portuguese, do you think? Um, so what's great about these is that they are genuinely love poems. They are poems that Elizabeth wrote in secret about Robert while Robert was courting her. And even Robert didn't know about them. She didn't tell him about them until quite a long time after they were married. Sonnets from the Portuguese, Sonnet 22. When our two souls stand up erect and strong, face to face, silent, drawing nigh and nigher, until the lengthening wings break into fire at either curved point, what bitter wrong can the earth do to us that we should not long be here contented? think. In mounting higher, the angels would press on us and aspire to drop some golden orb of perfect song into our deep, dear silence. Let us stay rather on earth, beloved, where the unfit, contrarious moods of men recoil away and isolate pure spirits and permit a place to stand and love in for a day, with darkness and the death hour rounding it. Fantastic reading there by Mark Padmore. Um, one of the, one shouldn't bring Europe into everything, but let's bring Europe into this. One of the things about Elizabeth Barrett Browning was she was not a local poet in any sense, was she? She moved to Italy, and well, Robert and her moved to, to Italy and um, had a, a huge and influential career over there as well. In um, Casa Guidi was the place they moved to. Yes, that's right. Um, Casa Guidi is the name of um, Elizabeth's 
um, and Robert's home eventually in Florence. Not quite the first place they lived in Italy, but they lived there fairly soon. Um, and it's also the title Casa Guidi Windows is the title she gave to a long poem that she wrote about Italian reunification. Um, it's a it's a sort of 30 page book, as it were. Um, it's in two parts, um, written a year apart, more than a year apart, um, as her convictions waned. But um, Elizabeth was um, a kind of unnatural for um, uh, the Italian struggle for liberation from the Habsburg Empire for um, a, de a democratic, a, a republican, you know, reunification. Unification. I think because she had this sense of the importance of self-determination, which was partly a religious sense from her dissenting Christian background and was partly um, a product of this, this living with disability, this having to try and find ways to have autonomy, even when she had very little bodily autonomy um, at times. Um, what she wasn't, as she wrote to Kenyon telling him, was actually socialist. So on the one hand, she was really inspired by scenes of joy at, at liberation. Um, but then on the other hand, she was slightly horrified when she realized that the upshot of a republic would be some of the things that were going on in France, like um, uh, uh, guaranteed work um, and and cooperatives and so on, and she was why, so she was not so much the terror as as this. She was she was really worried about. Why was she worried about that? Because she wasn't a socialist. She was actually quite conservative. Right. Okay. You know, she she lived. She, she although Casa Guidi is not actually very big, and she wasn't actually as wealthy as um, well, she wasn't remotely as wealthy in her married life as. Um, her childhood um, in the mansion of Hope End in Herefordshire, where she spent 26 years growing up, mm -hmm. um, would, would have led her to believe. Um, she, she, you know, she, she was quite class conscious and she, she did call her maids by their surnames. And she, although she was loyal to them and loved them in the, the, the manner of her time, she didn't want to see the end of a hierarchical society. She just thought that the Italians ought to be ruled by Italians. Um, <laughs> right. And she also kind of, I'm, it, it would be simplistic to say that she liked the fancy dress of the parade. I mean, much more than that. Right. And I think having become an abolitionist, she kind of understood sort of a sense of the rights of man and he did the rights of women. And so a sense of, um, you know, one man, one vote, as it were. She, she yeah. would go as far as that, I think. Um, yeah. But she was very persistent in her love of Italy and her desire to see, well, to see Cavour as a premier and so on. Um, I mean, she, it's not just Casa Guidi Windows, it's also, she also, her last collection before her posthumous poems um, was Poems Before Congress, which is about, um, it takes its title from a Congress which was supposed to help Italy out of the difficulties which result from, um, well, from blockades and from, from war. Um, and she felt, and Britain was supposed to come to this Congress and didn't. And so this book was received in Britain as a very anti-British book, whereas in fact, one could say it was more of a pro-Italian book. Mm. But so, yeah. so it's two collections about um, Italy. But then she, again, she's not doing something that's so different from other intellectuals and radicals of her time. I mean, she was very attracted to Germany, Italia. And I mean, you know, she, she moves to, she gets married and goes to Italy in 1846. So you think of 1848, there we are, it's coming. It's coming down the, yes. down the track towards her. Um, but, you know, Mary Shelley was also very taken up with Germany, Italia. So there's a very, there's a kind of zeitgeisty thing going on as well. A kind of yeah. slightly, you know, this week's cause. Yeah, but it, it was a bit more than that for her, wasn't it? I mean, she was not only doing the zeitgeist, but she was, one of the leading figures in this. I mean, in Italy, she had a state funeral. She was she had a state funeral, yes. Seen as this huge figure who was was talking about Italian liberation, if you want to call it that, and that that's a huge part of her existence. Yes, absolutely. And of course, Italy then was a poor country. We have to remember that um, you know the sense it would be a bit like someone making the case in the states now for I don't know a country like, I don't know, Georgia or somewhere. Um, you know, there's there such a disparity in the kind of expectations and national sense between Britain and Italy that 
that sh shifting the middle ground of middle Britain's opinion about Italy was an enormous act of leverage that yeah. Elizabeth performed for f on behalf of Italy. And she um, performed it, I think, partly so successfully because she was also incredibly in touch with, had a feel for that, 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 that society, that community. She wasn't, she was very unromantic in the sense that she wasn't ahead of her time. She wasn't a radical. She wasn't an elite in that sense. She responded to and wanted to respond to her generation, her time. Um, it's a very different project in a way. She's in a sense articulate. She's almost, you know, purifying the dialect of the tribe, not quite that, but she's mirroring back to her people mm -hmm. what their values are or should be, a kind of slightly polished, a slightly upscaled version of their values and their morals. Yeah, I think I think we should hear a reading from Category Windows. Before that, I'm just going to remind people if they want to do any questions, then do so now. Also, if you want to buy the book, I know that's redundant because you've all bought it already. But for the two or three of you who are out there who just haven't invested their money, just hit the button and buy the book. And now we're going to a reading of Casa Guidi Windows. From Casa Guidi Windows. I heard last night a little child go singing neath Casa Guidi Windows by the church. O oh, bella libertà. Stringing the same words still on notes he went in search so high for, you concluded the upspringing of such a nimble bird to sky from perch must leave the whole bush in a tremble green, and that the heart of Italy must beat. While such a voice had leave to rise serene twixt church and palace of a Florence street, a little child too, who not long had been by mother's finger steadied on his feet. And still, o bella libertà, he said. For me who stand in Italy today, where worthier poets stood and sang before, I kiss their footsteps, yet their words gainsay. I can but muse in hope upon this shore of golden Arno as it shoots away through the heart of Florence, neath the four bent bridges, seeming to strain off like bows, and tremble while the arrowy undertide shoots on and cleaves the marble as it goes, and strikes up palace walls on either side, and froths the cornice out in glittering rows, with doors and windows quaintly multiplied, and terrace sweeps, and gazes upon all, by whom, if flower or kerchief were thrown out from any lattice there, the same would fall into the river underneath, no doubt it runs so close and fast twixt wall and wall. How beautiful! The mountains from without listen in silence for the word said next. What word will men say? Here, where Giotto planted his campanile like an unperplexed question to heaven, touching the things granted a noble people who, being greatly vexed in act, in aspiration keep undaunted. What word says God? For the heart of man beat higher that day in Florence, flooding all her streets and piazzas with a tumult and desire. The people with accumulated heats and faces turned one way, as if one fire both drew and flushed them, left their ancient beats and went upward to the palace pity wall to thank their grand duke who, not quite, of course, had graciously permitted at their call the citizens to use their civic force to guard their civic homes. So one and all of the Tuscan cities streamed up to the source of this new good at Florence, taking it as good so far, presageful of more good. <laughs> 
the first torch of Italian freedom lit. Mark Padmore there reading three extracts from Cars of Greedy Windows. The first is the famous um, scene setting, the opening between the church and the palace, between church and state as Italy is. And the second is the kind of Stondahl syndrome, her own Anglo perspective on an Italy of art history full of art treasures. And a third passage describing what was actually her own first wedding anniversary when she and Robert waved from their terrace to the Florentines and Tuscans processing to the Pitti Palace, which is just around the corner from Casa Guidi, um, to sort of render thanks to the Archduke for the concessions he'd made um, to Florentine, well, to Tuscan self-determination. All well and good. But her books that you your biography drove me to and it's great Aurora Lee um yes. this astonishing book which you know uh reading it where did this come from it's just an amazing insight into writing about poetry and about life and and so forth T tell us about it <laughs> I think is the basic question tell us about <laughs> Aurora Lee. well let me show you on uh uh there we are uh it's not a first edition, but it's a it's an early edition. Mm. Can, um, can I just stop you for one second? If anyone here who's watching hasn't read Aurora Lee, read Aurora Lee. Back to you. Aurora Lee is um, many things. One of which is a page turner. It's really interesting. It, it's Elizabeth Bat Browning's masterpiece, um, and it's a it's a novel in verse, which of course is why it hasn't had quite the rediscovery that uh, the great nineteenth century women prose writers and novelists have had because we are allergic to verse, it seems. But um, not only was it an international bestseller, which sold out 20 editions in its first months of publication, and, and critically acclaimed by everyone from John Ruskin to Thackeray to, um, well, to, to the, 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 called the panoply of critics in the newspapers about whom we were talking earlier. It's also the first woman's buildings romance. So it's the first, story by a woman about how a woman becomes and of course that's a very serious form by the time Elizabeth is writing um, and has published Aurora Lee. Um, I mean since Goethe's The Sorrows of Young Werther, Versa, it's been a it's been a significant form because a way of interrogating what makes us human. Um, it's also the first woman's Kunstler roman. <laughs> so it's the first um, account of how a woman maker becomes and you can see therefore instantly the appeal to other women makers particularly women poets at the time um, book five in particular is a kind of great long ars poetica in which elizabeth barrett browning explores all her beliefs about what makes a good poem through the persona of aurora lee because it's aurora lee whose story it is and aurora lee um, becomes a poet and she becomes a poet through the enormous success of her autobiographical verse novel. Um, so it's a masterpiece um, verse novel, semi-autobiographical, written by Elizabeth Barrett Browning about Aurora Lee's autobiographical verse masterpiece which is buried inside the book, which we never get to read. Um, I mean, we read Aurora Lee, but we don't read Aurora Lee's book. Aurora Lee's book is told in, story is told in nine books. And I borrowed that structure for Elizabeth's life, even though I have to say the phases in Elizabeth's life and the phases of Aurora Lee, Lee's life don't match up, as you will probably have noticed having read both. Absolutely, yes, but... The, the, the thing about Aurora Lee, and, and I want to go back to this, is slightly that, that idea of boxes within boxes that, I mean, it's incredibly sophisticated, isn't it? Um, yes. I, I was going to say for its time, but for any time, but that she does this, that she takes her struggle, if you want to put it that way, and she a, fictionalizes it, but then puts it within this incredible structure i mean it's, it's one of the great books of the the of the time isn't it it is absolutely it's it's a it's a mighty book and um 
yeah, you're right. In a sense, it is a now scarred of her her era, because although um, Aurora Lee has a quite a dramatic life, um, you know, in a sense, most of the melodrama is <clears throat> delegated to uh, subsidiary secondary characters, so to the love interest, or to who goes blind and loses her life's work in a fire, or to a young woman whom she has mentored called Marion Earl get it, marry an earl, um, mm -hmm. who is trafficked into prostitution, has an illegitimate child, and there's lots of very radical writing about it isn't the woman who's been trafficked who is the sinner, it's the men who, are, who use her, and about offering the child, who is a result of that, in effect, rape, um, a secure home, even though it's in a one-parent family, um, and supporting Mary and supporting the child, that's another set of boxes, actually. Um, and I also find it very useful for thinking about biography in general, um, because you know biography always is always putting a frame around a life, isn't it? I mean, it's <clears throat> selective at the at the first level, um, simplifying a life or simplifying an intellectual development into a narrative is um, it's not arbitrary, but it's it's not innocent either. Something is going on, something is, several things are going on, and those things that are going on are being supplied by the biographer, fairly obviously. And that sense that the biographer should acknowledge their own lack of innocence, should acknowledge the frame that a biography is, seemed to me very important. And I really wanted to think about that in this book because, particularly because, because Elizabeth Bat Browning's life is about so much about the becoming of a poet in a way that other writers lives perhaps have a different emphasis but that's the key thing about her the kind of the gradus ad parnas and the difficulty of becoming um and because her masterpiece is also about that there's obviously a reflection going on and i think in any case because elizabeth was an invalid to use that old-fashioned term lived with disability so much of her becoming was becoming a writer and therefore so much of the mirror or the frame in which um, she could see, we can see her emergence as a person is in her writing, not just because those are the only traces, because they're not, but there's a sort of Elizabeth becomes Elizabeth by dint of her poetry in, in many ways. And so that sense of mirroring seemed to me extremely interesting. Mm. And the reason I've called, sorry, no, go on. Sorry. Well, I was going to say the reason I've called the book Two Way Mirror is because I'm very interested in that idea of biography's portraiture and that sense that, you know, in the portrait, the subject looks back out at us, but actually is looking back at the portraitist who is kind of hidden behind us. You know, mm -hmm. they don't get seen and implicated. Um, it seems as though the person whose portrait is being shown is involved in a two exchanges looking at us, but actually they're not. There's something that has been cut off in the same way as um, two-way mirrors, which you know I think are used in interview rooms and police stations, but they're certainly also used in mental health care units or used to be in the days when I worked in them, where mm -hmm. you know the staff sit behind a what looks to the people in the room like a mirror, um, but actually people behind it are watching. So there's a kind of interrupted gaze. There isn't, a, there isn't a fair exchange of knowledge, just as there isn't between our biographical subjects and us as biographers, is it? Because, I mean, they can't answer back to us. They don't even know we've written the biographies in, these, in cases of, you know, dead subjects. Uh, that's brilliant. We're, go we're going to go to a reading from, um, from Aurora Lee now. Um, I just want everyone who's watching to remember the, the word radical, which Fiona said earlier, because... I think one of the things about this is it's a radical book and you don't want to just nestle it away as a non-radical book. It's incredible mm -hmm. radical. After which there's a question and answers. If you haven't already sent a question and do so, the organizers have told me we've got for like four or five hours where we can do this. So, so do send the question through. But now a reading of um, Aurora Lee. From Aurora Lee, book three. They yelled at her as famished hounds at a hare. She heard them yell. She felt her name hiss after her from the hills like shot from guns. On, on. And now she had cast the voices off with the uplands. On, 
Mad fear was running in her feet and killing the ground. The white roads curled as if she burnt them up. The green fields melted, wayside trees fell back to make room for her. Then her head grew vexed. Trees, fields turned on her and ran after her. She heard the quick pants of the hills behind. Their keen air pricked her neck. She had lost her feet, could run no more, yet somehow went as fast. The horizon red, twixt steeples in the east, so sucked her forward, forward, while her heart kept swelling, swelling till it swelled so big it seemed to fill her body. Then it burst and overflowed the world and swamped the light. And now I am dead and safe, thought Marion Irvin. Aurora Lee, read by Mark Padmore, and if I hadn't emphasised this enough, read Aurora Lee. Read Fiona's book first, and then read Aurora Lee. It's quite an amazing book. Um, question and answers. We've got a few questions have come in. Um, well, gosh, I've just moved to my screen, and there's a lot of questions have come in. So let's go with Carol first of all. Um, Fiona, can I ask what was the thinking behind the frames that introduce each chapter? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, well, I, I I think that biography is, as I've just think I said, not an innocent art, and I, I am really quite interested in it. I'm really I'm fascinated by people, which is why I'm why I'm a biographer. But I'm also I don't want to put myself in the book, but I want to look at the book doing itself, and I am really interested in portraiture. I mean, one of the things I found while I was working on Elizabeth about Browning was. I had a real difficulty getting started because I was still in love with Mary Shelley. Well, what does that mean? I mean, the kind of, it seems like a very simplistic emotional overinvestment, but that kind of sense of, you know, and it is in a sense, because I didn't know her. I don't know either woman. I've never, I can't meet them. Um, and yet I'm extremely interested in them, extremely absorbed by them. I feel I think about them in a three in as many dimensions as I think about friends of mine. So, you know, emotional and spiritual and moral and whatever, intellectual and physical. And, you know, so really <coughs> what's going on there? And it, at the heart of Casa Guidi in the reconstructed apartment, which has been brilliantly refurbished, largely by Philip Kelly, the great um, Browning archivist, um, with with much of the original stuff and certainly accurate reproductions of everything that was there when Elizabeth Barrett Browning died there, um, is a great ornate mirror, um, which was the one that Elizabeth looked at herself in uh, every day. And the straight, and indeed it looks out of Casa Greedy windows because it's hanging opposite the long windows. And the strangeness of that, the strangeness of there being a mirror in which we can look, in which she looked, but we can't see her there, is just very, it's something very seductive and I wanted to play with it. And I, I guess the short answer too is I just don't want to play biography straight. <laughs> Fantastic. I love the short answer right at the end. That's brilliantly done. Um, I've just gone back to the screen. There's so many questions. So I advise people to get another glass of wine, maybe a kebab, and we're going to move on to the next question. Tim Robertson says, how much do you think EBB continues to influence poets today? Oh, and I think not enough. Um, but I think that for some women, I, I think she's a very important presence at the back of your mind. Um, and I'd like to see her move more to the front of our minds. Um, I think in British poetry at the moment, we're not terribly good at reading actually the canon. And I think that, as I've sort of alluded to, I think that we aren't terribly good beyond poetry at re in Britain at reading poetry anymore it's just not our thing it's not the same as it is on the island of Ireland for example or I don't know in um, Serbia um, it's just um, not seen as interesting cool attractive it's just seen as really problematic even among the literary chattering classes um, and so that means that in a sense, the canon is a series of names, a kind of mental slide index, I think. Um, uh, and it's not actually 
a kind of living tradition always. And so it's very hard if someone is pushed out by the gatekeepers, as Elizabeth Barrett Browning was brutally, really, in the second half of the 20th century, um, by the kind of the Harold Blooms and so on, the Lionel Twillings, that kind of generation of male critic. Um, how do we bring her back? And it's important that we do because maybe, you know, poetry won't always be such an underregarded resource. Um, and also because there's just something, some really important woman's work about um, bringing back the women and making sure that we keep the record turning. Because if we don't, that's a kind of lie about history and therefore a lie about where we are now. Mm. I'm going to ask a supplementary question, which is against the rules. But um, it's, it, one of the things that's striking about her, you mentioned self-determination before, and that's different, isn't it, to self-expression? And I think yes. one of the interesting things about her is that she determines herself and, and, and then uses art. She studies the Greeks, studies poetic forms in order to express herself. And that's not just saying what she reckons, is it? Yes, and it's not saying what she feels either. And that's absolutely right. I mean, she does see, even though she sees poetry as a handmaid of philosophy, she does see poetry as a form of thinking. And indeed, one of the reasons she was, took so, it took her such a long time to tell Robert Browning about um, the sonnets from the Portuguese was that he and she were both very, again, confessional poetry. So actually he and she would both have much rather it been the case that they were indeed a literary act of translation of somebody else's um, poems. Mm. And there's a whole stuff, series of, you know, as it were, frames about a literary homage to letters from Portuguese nun and so on, which are kind of great erotic romantic texts and um, European texts and so on, and translated if you're a British reader. So, um, so yes, I think she, I think she, is a very, there's, there's a thinkiness, a kind of, not colloquial, but a kind of speaking quality in her verse, which is very, it's not conversation, not colloquial, but because she's not using uh, ornate language and she's using often quite sly or clunky rhymes and she's quite transgressive with this meter that it cost her so much to learn from Greek prosody. There's a kind of speakingness, a kind of personality rather than a set of confessed feelings or confessed life that comes through her poetry. And that I think is very, very modern. Absolutely. Alice Stainer has asked, would you say that the very fact she was modern, in quotation marks, in the sense of channeling the Victorian zeitgeist, as you've said, particularly in some of the more sentimental aspects, was detrimental to her reputation after her death as part <laughs> of a reaction against Victorianism? Yeah, that's such an interesting question, Alice, and thank you. And I think that's absolutely true because I find it's I find the same resistances in myself as a reader. The bits that I'm uncomfortable with are the sentimental bits. Um, but I think that that, in a sense, I think that that's that too. That wheel will turn because I'm mean, you know Victorianism, Victoriana has had its movings in and out of fashion. You know, even in recent decades. You know, the kind of the way that, for example, Pugin and kind of high Victorian Gothic architecture kind of came back in. Um, and I even painters like Alma Tadema suddenly being respected and having exhibitions and so on. And um, so I think that, um, I think that Victoriana is not as disparaged as it was in the sixties and seventies. I think that, um, we've moved away again from it a little bit um, in terms of sentiment. I mean, it's hard for me to tell because at the moment I'm so embedded in romanticism that it, it feels to me as though our contemporary literary tastes are more towards the romantics and we're more you know, interested in, in, in what they had to say and we're returning to them more and that may well be what's going on. But I don't think that that'll be permanent. You know, I think that you know, contemporary culture is pretty capable of kind of kitchen sentiment. And I, for one, have certainly looked at lots of 
baby armadillos and mm -hmm. you know little goats jumping from haystacks and so on in you know in in lockdown i mean you know online <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know i i don't, I don't think we're we quite managed to transcend <laughs> them, so i'm confessing this pete didn't know <laughs> um the next question comes disturbingly from the moderator which sounds like we're in a philip k dick novel um but fiona mentioned that her biography drew on new archival, archival material not available previously. Can you tell us more about this, Fiona? Yeah, well, it's not arcane because it's all available. There's an absolutely wonderful resource, which is the Browning Correspondence. Just Google it and you'll find it. And it's um, it's incredibly well resourced and has been for decades. It's a decades long project led by Philip K Kelly um, with um, the Armstrong Browning, Armstrong Library at Baylor University, but um, it's online, it's a whole series of volumes of, of the correspondence uh, funded by National Endowment for the Arts, so I should say in the States. Um, and it's collating all the primary correspondence, so all to and from Robert and Elizabeth and anybody else who wrote directly to and from them, but also all the secondary stuff too. So, you know, siblings of Elizabeth writing to each other and, and then collating portraits and um, it's just an incredible resource. And, you know, in the in recent decades, that has been bought and brought together, and indexed and transcribed, and it's it's available. Um, doesn't quite go up to the end of Elizabeth's life yet, but so because obviously Robert lived quite a long time after Elizabeth died. So if you're a Bro Robert Browning scholar, it's you know you've got more you've got to more to wait for than if you're an Elizabeth scholar because it goes up to very close to Elizabeth's death now, um, and the material is all there. So. That just makes an enormous difference instead of having to kind of contact you know distant relatives who've maybe got one letter here and something else there so i mean you know it's not a matter of um having to go and you know do that or have somehow you know um like the aspen papers you know have an in with the right people you know it, it's it's simply a matter of doing the basic scholarly work of reading resources now but it wasn't and yet 40, it's taken us nearly 40 years to now get another biography of Elizabeth Bat Browning. And, you know, no, I feel like nobody's using this material. I, I should also say, you know, that it, it was a great disappointment to me that I couldn't get any of the gatekeeper publishing houses to produce a contemporary edition of Elizabeth Bat Browning's poetry to come out at the same time as a biography, which you would have thought would be a slight no brainer. Um, there are fabulous comprehensive scholarly editions, but there's not, you know, a good reliable imprint edition but no this was kind of reinforcing no we don't want to know about her because we don't know about her from a quite a lot of gatekeepers i've been quite shocked yeah yeah uh, speaking of which i'm going to ask one more supplementary question before we go to our, our final audience question and um if i may i was just looking at you know the recent archival material and looking at that experience was there something that surprised you about elizabeth barrett browning when you came to her the first time or throughout the, the experience? I think I was, well, I think I was surprised how feisty she was because, you know, I had absorbed the cultural myth of this kind of, you know, swooning lady on a couch. And although I knew that she was more important than that because I loved her work, I mean, she might have kind of just come to that very easily. I didn't know that it would be a book all about willpower and determination and endurance. Um, and I've really liked that about her. I, I have a lot of time for people who put in the hard yards. And do, do um, you like her? Do you like Elizabeth Barabani? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I like her very much. I find barriers of class and sentiment when I uh, think about her. But I do. I. I really admire her and I think I think also, you know, it was very hard finishing this book during the pandemic because there she is in her throughout her life, fighting for breath, coughing, nearly dying from, you know, chest infections, which at the time when I got the commission for the book seemed like a kind of safely in the past 19th century thing. And of course now we know it's not. And so in many ways it was very hard to write. But then on the other hand, it was very salutary to be writing at this time and also useful because you know you realize that 
all of her achievement was against the grain of, you know, chronic, really severe illness. I mean, one knows that about D.H. Lawrence, for example, but I didn't really necessarily know it about Elizabeth Barrett Browning and the sense of, you know, just how hard it is to work and to write well when, you know, a large proportion of your faculties are kind of thinking, am I about to die? You know, I mean, it must be, it's extraordinary. Mm. Fantastic. There's a lot more questions. We're going to have to stop at one more because, you know, the people from the British Library, they've all got their onesies on, they've got their nachos, they're ready for bed. Um, but there's one more question that I'm going to ask you, and I think it kind of brings all those things together we were talking about. William Grunewagen says, how was the oh. runaway slave received at the time of publication? Thank you, Willem, and how nice to hear from you. Um, well, um, it was... It was so the it was published first in an American abolitionist publication. So it didn't have the sort of clear ringing impact on British public opinion that it would have if it had been published here. Um, but it was taken very seriously. As she was taken seriously in America, I mean, she was taken up by the kind of the young America movement. Well, actually it's it's just its precursor, um, which is the kind of culture making, which was going to produce all sorts of figures like Hawthorne and so on, but, um, and Melville. So, and which was therefore kind of young and radical and progressive. Um, so it was, you know, it fitted right in. I think it is interesting though that she returns to rape in Aurora Lee and, in, and, and writes at even greater lengths in a sense about the subject there because there's nothing in her correspondence around that that sort of says, well, I see myself as feminist. I see, it just was common sense to her. And um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, exci I'm, I'm excited by that. You know, I think, I think that's a kind of great act of courage. Um, and I, I should also say, Willem, since, you know, in homage to your, your work as a translator, that um, towards the end of her life, she, did quite a lot of poet to poet translation. She prepared her poems. In other words, she prepared kind of literal notes for her Italian translator. And I think that as we've worked together like that, you and I, I think you'll be amused by that fact. Fantastic. Now I've got um, three last things on my running sheet. One is remind you to buy the book, buy the book, buy the book and then buy Aurora Lee. There's the book, Fiona is holding up the book. It's a magnificent book. It's really, really, really good. As is a royal league. So buy both of those and um, the next month of your life will be absolutely fantastic. The next thing on my running list says, closing remarks, remind audience by the book. That was the one I did. Peter says goodbye, which has a kind of melancholy feel to it. Goodbye. Goodbye. And then it says end slide. But for all that, I'm going to thank Fiona Sampson for A, writing the biography and for a wonderful night's entertainment. And I hope you enjoyed it. And um, Fiona, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for a great evening. And thank you to Mark Padmore. But thank you, Peter, for stepping in and rescuing our event with such consummate grace and ease. And I think we're going to end with some Aurora Lee, aren't we? So are this we? is this is well, yes, Elizabeth's Ars Poetica from book yes. five of Aurora Lee. Enjoy, everybody. Thank you for a great night. From Aurora Lee, book five. What form is best for poems? Let me think of forms less and the external. Trust the spirit as sovereign nature does to make the form. For otherwise we only imprison spirit and not embody. Inward evermore to outward. So in life and so in art, which still is life. Five acts to make a play. And why not 15? Why not 10 or seven? What matter for the number of the leaves, supposing the tree lives and grows? Exact the literal unities of time and place, when tis the essence of passion to ignore both time and place. Absurd. Keep up the fire and leave the generous flames to shape themselves. <laughs>